Hello. Can anyone hear me when I talk like this? So, okay, I'll use this. That's fine. Hello, uh, my name is Jay Palmer. I'm going to be talking about a fast track path for building Gen AI applications on Snowflake Cortex. I would talk about myself a little bit here, but I know you guys will get bored of it. You don't really care. So therefore, I'm just going to move on. But I will say one thing that I'm from Snowflake and I'm a really big Jim Carrey fan. So keep that in mind for later on. All right, this is just a slide to say, oh, there you go. This is a slide just to say, like, the stuff I'm talking about is some of its private preview. Just don't take things uh, away that might be detrimental to the organization and so on. So I said my piece. Anyway, so one of the good things about Gen AI is a concept of understanding a statement and you complete it. So it's called a completion exercise. Now, what I'm going to do is I want to start with a test, right, for everyone. And it's a test that's actually quite interesting. It's one of the, a, a question that everyone finds really interesting. The best color is. So this is a question that I have for the audience, right? So, ah, okay, so blue, okay, good. Okay, that's fine. I, Yellow, okay, good, that's, that's perfect. Next one, red, okay. So as soon as I, the, the funny thing is, right, let, let's talk about this. What did your brain actually do when I asked you that question, right? You went through a series of processes in your head. So first thing would be is the question becomes our prompt, right, from the completion exercise. Then you took in your head probability and statistics and said, okay, what could be the best color? What could be the best well, for you? And you were like, yep, blue, pink, green. For me, I would say like pink's quite a nice color, so I'm gonna stick with that one. And generally speaking, these are some of the colors that are actually sh shouted out today, which is actually quite nice. Yeah, you see, there you go. So as part of this exercise, right, there's a couple of things that happen in your head. You took everything that I've just said, you analyzed it with your massive neural networks in your brain, and you actually did a couple of things. You took the context, you applied some weights to it, and then you have your own biases. What's your favorite color? That's what really tells you all about it. And ultimately, off the back of it, you came to a conclusion. Now, that's great for you, but this is a completion exercise. What should be the right answer? to anyone who's asking a question to someone random. And the answer is, it's subjective based on individual opinion. But the thing is, what we did there, that actually shows you the complexity about building a large language model, about what kind of data you put into it. So if I ask you the same question again, the best color is, what would be the answer? Exactly. And, which, which, is, which is correct. So I've literally, which is quite impressive, I've just actually trained all of you, 100 people, to say the exact same answer. That's how this works. <laughs> so let, let's talk about the large language model. So the LLMs and so on, uh, LLMs themselves are actually pre-trained on a number of massively complex, un, uh, structured, structured and semi-structured data sets. Right? So it goes off, goes to the world, picks up some data and uses it, and that's what it's, it's learning. Off the back of it, what we need to do is then use something called fine tuning. There's a number of different elements to fine tuning. One's alignment tuning. For example, alignment tuning means like you're, you wanna make it harmless. So if there was a statement in this, so how do I hack my neighbor's Wi-Fi? Do you really want to come up with that? No, so you wanna say no, don't, don't respond to those things like that. Instruct tuning is all about giving it a supervised learning approach. This is, this is the input, this is my expected output. And the last one is general fine tuning, which is more about parameter efficient fine tuning or, or something like LoRa, which will actually go ahead and figure out what would be best for it. So therefore you're not making changes to the whole model, but you are changes, making changes in addition to the current model it is and weights it has. And last is the in-context learning. 
What you have in LLMs at the moment today is a concept of prompt engineering. You have to give it a bit of hint, some context, and then with that context, it's going to be able to correctly provide responses to your question that you're asking. So in our, a Snowflake's Data Cloud World Tour, I actually showed an example of how an app, which provides semi-structured data with only 25 lines of code, which you see there, actually respond back with not just a SQL statement. It provided what type of data you have in your database, what models you have, figured out the right model that needs to be done, then generated you the query for it, and then finally produced a graph, which is quite cool. So these are some of the nice complex things that you can do with LLMs. So this is just an example of the one I just showed. If you want more information or you want to know more, more about it, I can talk to you later on. So one of the things about Snowflake is, is some of the platform objectives we have today is to make sure that AI is for everyone. So the, but the first thing we need to do is protect the data. We want to make sure your data and your models are protected. We want to make sure we democratize the AI capabilities for the organization. And we want to alleviate burden right, on the overarching data science complexity and focus on just building products or building components. So how does this work? We're going to keep the uh, data safe, model secure, and keep it modeled based on Snowflake's RBAC. We're going to use AI every day and analytics within seconds. I mean, we should be able to leverage certain things in seconds, right? Because why, why would it take one hour, two hours, or a week and so on to develop things? Back to the point of time to value. We want to shorten that as much as we can. And then we want to deploy apps within minutes with things like, for example, Streamlit. So the platform itself is what you see here. You got use AI in seconds, apps in minutes, and a fully custom in hours. So I've talked about Streamlit already. If you're not familiar, it's a front end tool. Yeah, thank you. So um, Streamlit is a very, very good tool, very easy to do in Python. So you can build your own apps very quickly. You've got a full, fully custom in hours, which really talks about how you can actually start looking at your own way of working. How do you bring your own models into Snowflake? How do you start working with partner models? How do you do fine tuning all within the Snowflake ecosystem with Snowpark container services? All underpinned by the Snowflake's governed data and RBAC. But for today's session, I'm only going to be concentrating on the use AI in seconds. So we've got things like document AI, which looks at structured uh, sort of documents and then outputs certain information about that. You can search through that. We've got universal search, which gives you com pretty much what it means. It gives you ability to search any object and gives you something that's relevant to it, not exactly the same. And then it's Snowflake Copilot, which is like a text to SQL piece. Today, I'll be focused on Snowflake Cortex, uh, which does models and search. So what is Cortex? It is a fully managed service that serves industry-leading industry AI's models and vector functions. Now, what does this mean in the grand scheme of things? Pretty much what it means that all the LLM stuff that you've seen in the past, there's a lot of complexity regarding it. You've seen things like with OpenAI and ChatGPT, right? You have to send a request across. Someone needs to actually build that component, that integration element to it. How can we stop doing that? And I'm going to show you that in a second. But technically, we've built serverless functions for you to do a couple of things in detail. I went too fast. So these specialized functions do a couple of things. So these functions you can use within SQL. You can use it on your applications and uh, in Streamlit. But realistically, we've got things like translate. How do you translate um, a um, from language A to language B, so from English to French. How do you summarize information, extract answers? To how do you detect sentiments? You can now all do this by serverless functions in Snowflake. Right? And that is the LLM-based ones. The ML-based ones you see on the right, right, they're already available today for some of them. Some of them are in public preview and some of them are in private preview. But those are the ML-based ones, which I won't be talking about because I'm concentrating on LLMs today. But keep in mind, there's a lot of new serverless functions out there. So, so what does that mean then? So then how do I get a chat app to start leveraging this quite quickly? So we did build some general purpose functions in Snowflake. The, the LLM inference side and the vector search side. And what do these actually do? Right? They allow conversational LLMs really quickly and adapt massively. So for example, we got the complete function. 
you give it a string and it will do the completion for you, exactly as the first use case that we talked about when I gave you one a test. You got text to SQL, you got embed text. Embedded text means the fact that you build your embedded models, so if all they like, pass to the LLM model itself to do specific things, and I'm gonna get to that in a second. And then finally, you got to vector to distance that tells you how close certain things are to the question being asked. Together, you can actually bring them all together to actually build a really nice conversational app. But what's wrong with LLMs today? Right, you have hallucinations, as you're probably familiar. That is because there's missing data in the original corpus. Then you have inaccurate answers. There's out of date data. I mean, I remember reading a textbook that we had nine planets in our solar system. That's no longer the case. So when Pluto was taken out, I still don't agree with it, but it is what it is. So um, and then you have out of context um, answers, which is generic and misguided prompts. So off the back of it, you've got all these different things. How do you, just, how do you overcome this? So there's a concept of retrieval augmentation generation, and you can do this all within Snowflake. And, the, and what this means is the fact you've got your large unstructured data files on your left, right? You get the relevant information, you then convert it to an embedding. You take the embedding, you figure out how close something is to, to your search parameters, and then finally do a completion, which is with Llama. That is at a high level place on how do you augment LLMs that already exist today with more recent data. So there's something called chunking that's involved, and it's, a, it's something that we naturally do in our heads, but realistically, if you think about when you have large unstructured data sets, right, we split larger context of bodies into certain segments. These are more similar to one another, and this is a data engineering problem. So one of the key things that we do, once we do chunking from the data sets, we want to make it relevant. We then take a token that we have today, right, which in Cortex is the same thing. So if you look at, for example, an LLM map, the number of tokens in your initial prompt, is a, there's a max limit to them. Sometimes it's 3,000, sometimes it's 5,000. If you've got a document in there which has got 50,000, there's no way that's gonna work. So chunking is a way to be able to provide information and data to the model in a specific way which is relevant to it. So you'll be able to split it up and find the one that's most naturally aligned to the question in context based on the vector search capabilities is available. And I'm gonna go through a demo later on today. So, and one thing you need to make sure is the last statement there. We only wanna feed data that's the most relevant to the question being asked and to the model in question. Okay. So, this is what happens. We take a large unstructured data, we do the chunking which is relevant, that converts it into those embedded vectors, as you can see there and then you build everything together. Now, think of all the use cases you have today in your organization. What type of use cases can you now fulfill based on these capabilities? I'm gonna show an example from a demo perspective of a, I'm a massive Formula One fan as well, by the way, just to let you know. So therefore, I've taken the Formula One regulation PDF, boring document, right, and I'm gonna start working with it, and that's gonna be part of the demo today. But think out, just think in your minds, I'm not gonna ask you, for, just think about all the different types of options you have for your use cases, what documents you have today that could be beneficial. You might have a, a lot of flow documents where you looked at loads of issues within your organization, you can put them together, put it, give it to the LLM, and it can give you a round summary about things that you can say you can work on within your organization. That's just one example, but there's a hundred others that you can do. And you can make them very specific to a customer as well. So just bear that in mind. So I'm gonna work on the demo now, and this is the reason why I had to use a chair for this. Okay. So, I said, I know I'm, I'm risking it, I'm risking it, okay. So one thing I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna kick this off, so I'm gonna start this. So this is a Snowflake notebook, which is available. Right, it's not in public preview just yet, it's in private preview, so just, you won't see this on your, on your page. So I'm just gonna start running this. One of the things that we're gonna do is just import a, a couple of functions. The, the main important one here is gonna be the, the langchain.textsplitter, which you see here, which provides you import for your recursive character text splitter, which will actually do the chunking for us, which is pretty cool. 
and I'll show you that in a minute. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a database, which I just called it J Palmer Rag F1. Right, as you can see here, we're going to create a couple of um, schemas and a stage. Then I've uploaded a document called the F FIA 2024 Formula One Sport and Regulations. It's, what a long name. Anyway, the whole point here is that's a regulation document for it, as you can see. It's about one meg big. I will now then take a function that's written in Snowpark, all right, to take the, the file and extract that information from it. I'll register as a UDF. What is, what, what's a UDF? A UDF is something that you provide in one input and it provides you one scalar output. So this UDF will then say, okay, fine. You get the input, pass in a string, which would be the document ID in question, and it'll return you a string, which is the full list of the file. So we've facilitated that, that's great. So now what we do is we wanna create a table, right, of all the data that's available, right, in that file. So what I've done, I've done a, a user scope URL that tells you to give it the full file name, send it to the, the Snowpark PDF function, which we created previously, and then give me the data. Now, if I select all the data within here, there's a raw text. Oh, it's empty. It's part of the live demo. I'm just, I'm just kidding. There you go. It's all in there. <laughs> yes, you see? <laughs> so it's, it's all, the entire document is actually in this, func um, in, in this raw text field. Now, if I try and send this, text all the way to the model, which I'm about to do now, and Snowflake's complete. So to summarize the following text with the raw text information, it's gonna fail. And why did it fail? Exactly. So what do we need to do? Chunking, fantastic. So now what we're gonna do, we're gonna create a, a UDTF. So what a UDTF in Snowflake is a user-defined table function that you can provide in one output, I mean one input, and it can produce you technically a data frame and, and multiple records as well, which is actually pretty cool. So what we're saying, we're using that recursive character text splitter function from Langchain, and we say we need to separate, separate by every line. The chunk size is up roughly 1,000, but you can augment that. The overlaps, you might have some overlaps depending on how your document is to just fine tune it a little bit, but right now we're not doing that just for the demo. And then we wanna execute that process and provide multiple different chunks. So once we've done that, we want to say, okay, fine, fantastic. That's the function. Now we register the function. As you can see here, we're saying the fact that with every one input, the output's going to have a chunk, which is the chunk text, and there's metadata for it. And I'm going to now run that come on to provide you with that function ready to go, which is now green, fantastic. So now if I run the same thing again with the chunk data, you'll notice that this one file has been chunked into many relevant, well, in multiple different pieces. So these are your context, and it also tells you on the side where the start indexes are in terms of line numbers as well, which is pretty cool. This is the metadata. So we talked about the concept of chunking as the first part of, then we need to start looking at embeddings and about how you make the relevant. So now on converts to embeddings, we're using Snowflake's embed text function that we have, which is a serverless function which is available. Give it a model and give it a chunk. It will now go off and produce a bunch of a table with all the embeddings within that, which is pretty cool. So now we've got all the numbers, which are like those plus ones, minus ones, plus twos, and so on. So now that's all stored within this table called vector store F1. We want to now use our embed text function Right, right, just to see what it will come up with for a specific question, such as what temperature must fuel be stored at? And we want to combine it with the data from the, the chunks that we had and pass it across. So what we have here is that we've got the distance calculator based on the vector distance function that we've just done. So the vector distance function, if you remember previously, it, it takes a value, compares it to a value which you already had, and compares how similar it is based on the question you're asking. So what is defined as part of this embedded text, we pass it to the vector L2 distance function you can see up there. And it's saying 
the, the one that's most likely, which is this one chunk value here. Actually, maybe, maybe let me just focus on it. And this, there we go. So uh, actually, that's interesting. What would be the closest, zero or one? Would one be the closest or one would be the furthest? One would be the most similar? You're looking at similarities between the two. So you're looking at distances between objects. The closer the distance, yes, exactly. So in this case, what you'll notice is that this here, during refueling or fuel handling operations, that's the most relevant chunk. Seems to be working. So pretty cool. And now we've done that. Is that all done? OK, fantastic. So then we know that the vector search function works, the embedding works, everything seems to be working fine. How do I then have a user interact with this system? So what I've done now is I've, this is a Streamlit app, which is running inside Snowflake already, which is pretty cool. So I've called it F1. It's just loading. And I've, I've asked it a couple of things, actually. I said, one, select your model, because there's a couple of models you can select. So we've got Llama 2, 70 billion chat. And we also have the 7 billion. So I have to ask a question. Who's a fan of F1 here? Uh, do you have any questions about the regulations? Oh, on the spot. <laughs> Let's see what comes up. So it, it may or may not be there, so we'll find out. You see, so it's running. It's going to provide you back with a response. It's the first time doing it, so it's going to take a little while. The maximum is not explicitly mentioned in the given text. Uh, you see, so it's clever enough to know that it's not actually done. I mean, what I did do previously is just I, I went, okay, fine. There's a couple of couple of questions we can we can do. So, how many pit stops can a driver make, and what would be the answer to that? Correct. But does the model know that? Let's find out. According to the text, a driver can make multiple pit stops, but they must drive down the lane at greatly reduced speed. So it gives you a bit more context. So what we've done there is, this is all within Snowflake, our Cortex functions, which are now all serverless, you just chain them together to build this all with Snowpark and Streamlit in this case. So this, this was a live demo that worked really well. So I'm, I'm glad it all worked. So happy days, so, which is good. I know, thank you, thank you. So there's, so there's one thing that's still left. I've got one exercise for you to do. One question again, it's a completion one. How would you end this one, in case I don't see you? Sorry? Nope. Well done, fantastic. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night. If you remember originally, I said I was a Jim Carrey fan. And which film does this come from? Truman Show, well done, fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah.